All right, here we go. So this is my custom unit called Vortex Soup. And that's exactly what it's gonna do to the sound. And I'll go over what's going on here in a second. As you'll notice, this custom unit, it's collapsed down to like this tiny state. And we can achieve that um, by going to the immediate left of whatever chain you're in. And if you hit the M1 key, it will expand and collapse any units on the screen from its smallest sort of like one block state to however many parts of the screen it needs to display all its parameters. So in my case, if we expand this, my custom unit has a whole bunch of controls that I've added here. There's a ton of them. Um, immediately you might be like, well, why so many? And my answer is I wanted all this stuff immediately available instead of having to go into all sorts of chains and sub chains and dig around and find parameters. These are all controlling parameters all over the place within the custom unit. And I just don't, I don't have to go get digging for it. They're just right there, ready to go. Um, some of them I have uh, being controlled by external CV. Some of, them I, some of them I just have as buttons I can control here by selecting them. So I, I won't go into 100% detail on what everything is doing, but I'm just gonna show you the key bits just so you can get an idea of how useful these custom units can be. Um, for sort of containing a process. So let's take a look within my Vortex Soup unit. Oh, only two items, uh, two mixer channels. There's one called Grains, and there's one called Layerize. Kind of a bad name, I came up with it. Um, anyway, let's look in Grains, just so you can see what I'm up to here. Um, I'm basically using the inside of this custom unit as basically a two-channel mixer. Um, so each one of these mixers is receiving signals from somewhere and then just routing it out the output of this custom unit to my speakers. So if we take a look at grains, I have a, a single VCA in here being controlled uh, by an external source called grains with a capital G and due to bad labeling on my part, the actual audio input source is a different feed local control called grains. So what this means is, if we back out to my controls here, this grains here, this on and off toggle is basically opening and closing that VCA. So it's almost like a mute button. If I don't wanna hear it, I can turn it off. If I wanna hear it, I can turn it on. And then if we go to, actually let's just leave that off for a second. If we go over here, my lowercase grains, remember previously I was talking about linear faders and parking audio processes on it. If we go into this, um, my input source is D3, which is my microphone. Um, I'm recording into a looper. And just as in a, a bunch of videos, I like doing this, I'll record into a looper and then the grains directly following it is tapping off the same buffer which means whatever I've recorded into that looper is now in the grains process. So if we look at our grains really quickly, I won't go over this too crazily. Um, our, our, our pitch control, volt per octave one, and if we back out, that's uh, a control here that my keyboard set to control. Um, our start time gets a little bit more interesting. Uh, I have a saw that's uh, basically just creating that perfect shape so we're, we're sweeping linearly across the, uh, the sample, which means we're just hearing normal playback in most scenarios. Um, and then within that, within this, I have a mixer called Drunk that introduces all sorts of wobble and random sort of envelope follower sort of stuff. Um, so it's not a linear, start to finish access of that sample. And then I also have a sample and hold um, set to a toggle. So if I press a button, it'll basically lock the uh, pitch position CV wherever it's sitting. Uh, so at the end of the day, if as I'm working, it's basically just called pitch lock. And if I wanna add some of that weird wobble stuff to that sample player, that granular process, I can just hit drunk. <laughs> or I can hit pitch lock. So let's, you know what? 
let's let's just go through all this in a real world scenario now. Um, actually, one last thing. My looper punch is assigned to a process called grain record. And all that means is I just have it on a, a layer right here. So if I hit record here, it's gonna dump stuff into the looper and then I have full grain access. So sort of a, a mouthful, but check this out. I have my, my uh, singing bowl. I'm just gonna uh, hit record and just, uh, you'll see what happens. All right, so my pitch buffer is approximately a few seconds, so let's turn on my grains. And if you can recall, my pitch lock basically freezes the uh, that CV wherever it's sitting. My, my uh, duration, is this. And if we look at our grains, just to show you what's going on here, that's actually controlling um, this duration parameter. How big is each grain? Is it small or big? But I don't have to go in here. This is all right on the surface. And then my pitch control is my keyboard. So. And then this is my drum process right here. It's basically just randomly grabbing spots of the sample position and starting playback. Uh, it's not jittery because I have an envelope follower sort of smoothing the values slightly. Um, now here's the one thing I wanted to talk about. So I have this thing called freeze and it's activated the moment I send it a gate signal from a keyboard. And I have this thing here called Slice. And on the forum, Joe came up with this brilliant way of being able to switch sources. So each one of these mixers has a tap tempo and a bunch of ra rational VCAs to, to control the gates on or off um, to open or close each of these channels. And I have that controllable by my wad wheel. So It's basically sending divisions of a trigger. So if I lower my duration, I get some cool in-time stuttery effects. And I have it set using that same sort of amazing switching that he came up with to control another set of v uh, VCs after it. So if I press down on my key, it's doing this stuttery effect stuff. And if I release, then it's sending a non sort of sliced signal to that grains trigger. So we almost have like a flip flop situation built out of ECAs, which is pretty neat. So. That's my grain, my grain side of this whole thing. And I can just mute it because I have that control here. And then the second part of this unit I made is called Layerize, kind of lame, but whatever. Uh, it's basically a looper tapping off that exact same grain signal. And I have the punch set to an outmost control. I also have the recording dub set to an outmost control. And what that means is on the fly, I can decide to record this. So let's start with this. Um, here's my on off control for that looper. And I have it 
set so this LS1 here controls the dub signal of that looper. So let's try something. I'm just going to, uh, my layer button here is actually the punch control for that looper. And let's, uh, now recording this into the looper. So there we go. So now we have a recorded element sitting on the looper. Um, if I play something on my keyboard, we're not hearing anything because my grains is turned off. But if I turn that on, we'll be able to hear that. So uh, that's sort of the sound I want to dial in right there. That's pretty good. Maybe I'll set it to uh, my drunk mode. So it's a little bit irregular. Let's kick into record again on the looper. So this is what I'm recording into the looper right now. So there we go. So now our looper is playing back this, this two layered sort of sound element. Let's just turn that off for a minute. What else can we do here? Sounds kind of weird. Let's uh, let's record in that element. I could choose to hear the grain still, but I'll just turn it off and we'll just listen to our looper. So there we go. So now we have three elements sitting on our looper of all these weird sort of processes. I could choose to turn that off. Uh, while we're not hearing it, I could choose to record again. On top of that, uh, I could I could update the samples within the grains unit. So. Let's see what that sounds like. So that's my voice now. <laughs> Turn off pitch lock. Turn off drunk. Let's hear what that sounds like against our looper. I'm not gonna record it. Pretty weird, but you know what? Let's use it. Why not? So, pretty weird patch, but uh, this is all a self contained unit. Uh, this is just one element. Um, I could still have uh, sample players triggering drum sounds, I could have you know, tempo sync, de sync delays on top of this. Um, this whole process is taking 54% power. So not bad considering all the madness I have going within. Um, it sounds even more crazy uh, with like rhythmic drum sounds and stuff like that, but I just decided to use my singing bowl because it's the only thing I have sitting around nearby. Um, but hopefully that just gives you more of an idea of how local controls can be used within a custom unit uh, to feed a whole bunch of different things at the same time all over the place. Um, and actually, you know what, it's it's worth noting now because a few people have asked, well, what's the difference between a local control and a global control is, let's say I'm outside of this custom unit. Like let's say I am I have something right before it, like a mixer channel or something. If I go to my assignments, and go to local controls, nothing's available. Uh, all I have available would be inputs and whatever I have in globals, which we'll get to in a second. Um, whereas if we're within this custom unit anywhere, like let's say I add another mixer here, this could be anywhere within this custom unit. It could be like five layers deep, 10 layers deep, whatever. If I go to my input assignment, if I go to locals, here's all those parameters on the topmost level um, available. 
So I could choose what I want to feed. It could be like a master clock signal, uh, whatever you need it to be. And that's that's what local controls are. They're, they're parameters available anywhere within a custom unit. Uh, let me just show you quickly uh, how global controls work. Um, same idea as locals. The only difference is I have to go to the admin area and then global chains. And these are more useful for global sources. And a great example of that, just a simple one actually, is we can create a mono chain here. I'll just call this clock. And it could really be anything. I'll just put a sine wave here just, just so you can see. So let's say this sine wave running at 2.97 hertz is our clock source. And you can see there's a waveform there. Um, anywhere in the system now, I've switched back up to user, anywhere in the system, I can tap that signal. So basically, if I wanted to reset my loopers, I could hit this one and I could go to my input assign. And now if we toggle down to local or globals, there's our clock signal and I can assign it and you can see it. So if I go back to my global source, my global chain, sorry, and I change the speed of this so it's really quick, if we go back up to user, it's reflected. Like it's an internal digital patch from a global source to this destination. Um, I could be on a completely different channel and I could say, well, I want the input of channel three to be that global source. So you just go globals, there it is, there's my clock. And you can see it's labeled so you know exactly what's happening on or you can see exactly what's happening. Um, it could be something else. It could be like um, like a tap tempo unit or something. Like it really doesn't matter. You could you could use this for audio. You could use it for, for clock, CV, whatever you want really. Like I could have that global um, chain triggering this manual grains unit. So I could just go input assign, globals, clock, and there we go. So. If you have a whole bunch of sample players or grains in the system and you want them all to behave together in a unified way, you could have something from a global chain feeding it. So if I turn this down and I had that on five different grain units, they'd all behave exactly the same. So, so far I've used this sort of thing for, um, for clocks and sort of common CV signals between different processes, but, uh, you could sort of do what you want. I don't know. There's, you just got to figure out what works best as a global control, what works best localized within a custom unit. And there's diff there's applications for both, and there's no right or wrong way. Um, I just liked making all this in one massive custom control because I can save this whole thing as a preset, and I can drop this anywhere in the system. I could even, in fact, I could even put that on a global chain if I wanted to. So there's all sorts of crazy, crazy things you can do. But uh, at the end of the day, I guess you don't want it to be so crazy that you have no idea what's happening anymore. The whole, the whole concept of all this kind of thing is to make things easier, not more complicated. So if it doesn't have to be nested, don't make it nested. If it doesn't need a global control, don't make a global control. Um, yeah, hopefully this sort of made sense. I'm pretty sleepy today. And I may have rambled, but uh, please let me know if uh, you guys need any clarification on anything. But uh, please take a look at the forum, um, especially Joe's post about sequential switches, because um, that was sort of a huge breakthrough that he came up with to uh, switch between multiple sources, either sequentially or uh, CV controlled, which is great. So, um, yeah. All right. Have a good one. Take it easy. Bye.